There's a gravity, if you will, to John's account of the resurrection that just grabs me and holds on to me. One of the peculiarities of our faith tradition is that we get these four different accounts in which there are overlapping realities, but every one of the gospel writers draws on different elements of the story depending upon who they're writing their gospel account for and when and their particular focus in Jesus' ministry. So if we read, as we did last year, Mark's gospel account of the resurrection, it's short, it's frenetic, it's dark, it's fearful, and it ends in utter uncertainty as they go home and tell nobody. Matthew comes at the story completely different. His version is cosmic and apocalyptic. There are earthquakes and rending veils. The consequences of Jesus' death and resurrection for Matthew changes the very fabric of our reality. And then Luke. Luke with his soft doctor-like touch, layers the story on. I, I think of it almost as a tidal telling with waves crashing gently across the, store, the shore, nevertheless breaking rocks down into sand as he adds details and gains awareness through the cross, the empty grave, and the road to Emmaus. Uh, there are common elements to all four of our gospel tales. They all have certain agreement on things that happen. First of all, it's the women that went to the tomb, right? We don't have males going forward and telling the story. It's the women in their faithfulness and their observation of tradition that go to the tomb and become the witnesses. And as women have had to experience and justly for thousands of years, nobody believes them. The, the third thing that tends to happen is that angels end up having to get involved because, frankly, nobody believes what they're seeing. And so angels or even Jesus himself, as we just heard, get involved to interpret what's going on. And lastly, when confronted with the impossible possibility of resurrection, the disciples have an aha moment in which much of what Jesus has been teaching suddenly makes sense to them. Oh, this is what he meant by die and rise again. This is what he meant by tear down the temple and build it again in three days. We have these common elements to the story as they begin to wrestle and grapple with the significance of coming to pay homage to the dead and finding the tomb empty. And as we uh, confront this, uh, as we come to this reality this year, we've been traveling, for those of you who missed it, I'll give you a quick summary. Through Lent, we've been traveling through the eight R's of resurrection. We might say we were doing a spoiler alert to talk about resurrection a little early. Uh, but we talked about the need to think about having coming out of a year in which many of us feel like we stayed in the tomb all year. It was a year of quarantine. It was a year of canceled events. It was a year of social isolation. It was a year of deeply contested truths about the social isolation that may or may not be necessary. So, so for a lot of us, we talked about a year-long Lent, a year-long of giving things up that had defined our life. So as we engaged this Lent, we talked about this renewal. What does it mean for a field that's lain fallow for a year to think about finally coming to spring? Right? So we did repenting, reorienting our life, asking God to help us think about what should be the priorities we allow to spring out of this now maybe once again fertile field of our lives. We talked about learning to refuse 
the voices that would overcrowd our lives and ask of us more than we can do. We are creatures, not creators. Finite. We have limits, and God invites us to find them. So we refused, and then we reduced. What are things we want to let go of? We've learned they weren't life-giving for us, or they held us in the tomb. And so we reduced our imprint. And then we started to think about rethinking and repurposing our lives. What does it mean that we're repurposed for God's grace? That the values that we live in our life should reflect not the values of the culture around us, but the values of a Christ who chose to use his last day to wash people's feet and who died in deep love and mercy for everyone. As we rethought and repurposed, then we talked about the need to recycle and repeat. You get it? Everything was an R-E word as we did it again and again because for all the times we've been formed in the bad habits, in the competitive spirits, in the tearing each other down mentality, we have to spend an equal amount of time rethinking ourselves into more life-giving ways, to more God-blessed ways. If we were going to live a life like Christ, we need to spend as much time training ourselves to live that way as the society trains us otherwise. And that brings us then to this empty tomb. We arrive because while it was still dark, Mary got up and went to the, to the tomb to see her Lord. As we think about John's telling of this story, the, the story we're living in this year, uh, I want to take us back to the beginning. Let's just literally do that. December 24th, we gather we gather every December 24th. This is our Christ candle. There's a wreath around it. We've done the Advent candles, right? But the Christ candle isn't lit, right? And on December 24th at 5, 8, and 11, <laughs> we get to a moment in the service where we hear the opening words of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him, not one thing came into being. What came into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. There was a man whose name was John. He came to testify to the light, but he wasn't the light. The true light that enlightens everyone was coming into the world. And the Word became flesh. And that's when normally I have a candle. And lived among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. That monologue permeates John's entire understanding of Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. The light shines in the darkness, even the darkness of the tomb, and the tomb won't win. So while it was still dark, and in a moment when, on Friday, we suspected the light was gone forever, Mary got up and went to tend to the dead light. Only the tomb was empty. Having no idea what was going on, she brought others with her. She weeped. 
She was exasperated. This was the last straw of disappointment. Now she can't even find his body. Until again. But the darkness shall not overcome it. While she's looking in the tomb, that's not my pocket. While she's looking in the tomb, tap, tap, tap on her shoulder, she looks around. Oh, did you move the body? And all he has to say, Mary. And she knows. Rabboni, teacher. John wants us to know that in this moment we complete not a three-day story or a seven-day Holy Week, but the entire purpose of Jesus' life, that we understand that there is no such thing as a dead end from which God can't punch a hole for life to rise up. A light shines in the darkness and the darkness, be it the powers and systems of Rome or the religious professionals or the general doubt and fickle nature of the crowds, the darkness can't keep God's life down. And Mary sees it and experiences it. So I'd like to spend a little bit more time with Mary. but I'm going to put my tangible sermon illustrations away. First of all, Mary Magdalene is a complicated character. She belongs in the rosters of the 12 disciples, right? It's a name we should attribute. That's what she identifies him as, right? He says, Mary. She says, Rabboni, teacher. She is a disciple. The only disciple who came calling this day. The only disciple who makes it to the cross despite any fear that they, she too would end up on a cross, right? But tradition hasn't particularly liked that she was a woman, and so we've made all manner of character assassinations on Mary, implied she was a prostitute, left her out of the roles of important early Christian leaders, and yet it's Mary that God chooses. Again, another Mary God chooses to bear Christ for the world. So while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb. And I want us to pay attention to exactly the things that happened to Mary. The men here are rather useless. She will bring them into the story. This is what they'll do. They'll have a foot race to decide who can get there first and who's fastest. They'll have a little like, oh, don't go in there. Oh, he went in there. Well, if he's going to go in there, I'm going to go in there moment. They're going to look around. They're going to be like, oh, Jesus is risen. And then they're going to go home and do nothing with that story. That's what John tells us at least happens with them this day. Mary does this. Mary first wakes up while it's still dark. While life is hopeless and it feels like death has won, Mary still goes to work because that's what she does. So she gets up and she goes to the tomb. She confronts the unexpected. The tomb's stone is rolled away. The body isn't there. She immediately says, I don't know what's going on. Let me go get help. So she runs to people who she imagines will be helpful, and she tells Peter and the beloved disciple and the others, the, the tomb, it's empty. His body's gone. I don't know what to do. They run. They have their little foot race. They never talk to her. They discover that she's right. I guess she wasn't lying to us after all. And then they leave. At which point, Mary does something maybe they just weren't willing to do in public. She breaks down crying. She weeps 
the text says. This isn't a single tear. This is racking sobs. She weeps because this was the final straw that she can't handle. She allows her raw emotion to be exposed. She allows herself to be utterly vulnerable in this moment. If she doesn't do that, we get no experience of the risen Jesus in this moment. Understand me, the experience of the risen Jesus, the true eye-to-eye contact is made because she stays at the point of her greatest disappointment when the other two have gone home. And staring into the abyss, the abyss stares back into her. Right? So there she is weeping when the next thing that happens, she sees two angels. Now, I don't know about you, but no matter how tired, exhausted, and distraught I am feeling, if two angels show up, I'm probably joining Peter and the beloved disciple in that foot race. They ask her, why are you crying? And if I wasn't racing home before they asked that, I'm probably doing it now. Or we do a crying, you're crying, I'm not crying. Right? But Mary is too authentic for all that. They've taken my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. She's utterly vulnerable and then utterly honest, and then willing to stay in the moment and engage the impossible, at which point the truly impossible happens, tap, tap, tap. Why are you crying? A third person? Oh, this one's just the gardener. Where have you laid him? I just want to go put his body to rest. Just tell me where you moved his body to. Mary. Isn't it powerful when someone knows your name? When someone calls you by name? When you're having just the worst day of your life and you feel that, that idea that maybe God, God's self would come down and look you in the eye and say, Mary, Bill, Andrew. And that's all that was needed. It's like a, your mom's voice calling you in for dinner. You knew exactly who it was. Oh, teacher. So Mary, who's de- yearning to be taught, becomes our teacher. How do we experience the risen Jesus? How do we allow our lives to become witnesses to the power of God to make tombs empty? On Good Friday, we had a cross here and we had reflections from different angles and perspectives as we thought about the injustices that still go on in our world. Because among many of the things going on when Jesus is killed on the cross, it is the injustice not just of Rome or of a temple cult that was filled with their own power, but also the injustice of friends who denied him and betrayed him, and chose to sit this one out. And we recognize that we too have the power to do all those things. To decide this isn't my fight to get involved with. Why would I want to die with him? Why would I be the one that has to right the world's wrongs? And then we come to an empty tomb, to the tomb of the one who was willing to do that, And he shows us that life still finds a way and invites us with Mary to make our life a witness to that kind of power at work in the world, to make our lives a witness that we too can take spaces that have been about death and oppression and injustice and isolation and loneliness and misguided I don't know what to do with my lifeness. We too can take those spaces and give witness that the risen Lord is here 
and light is dawning on the backside of that tomb. But it requires us to look into the death around us, to be vulnerable before the disappointments in our life, to be honest about what's really hurting us or holding us back, to bring in help so that we're not doing it alone, and then to engage that help even when it's not the people you called on for help. We need to replicate Mary's journey if we want to replicate the experience of the risen Christ she had on that Sunday morning. The risen Christ would have risen without Mary. Uh, The resurrection would have happened without witnesses. The story was going to get out. But Mary's willingness to sit there and stay there transforms her life powerfully in ways that wouldn't have happened if she hadn't been there to witness it. We can continue to have those powerful stories if we create the spaces to tell this story with our lives for one another. Friends, May we be in the business of getting up while it's still dark, staring death in the face and having faith to imagine that God will bring life from it. This is the word of our Lord. He is risen. risen Amen.